Well, again, another wonderful day to be in the Lord's house together. So grateful to see each of you here this morning. Hope the Lord's blessed in your life. Hope you're uh, glad to be here today. What a what a, a beautiful day the Lord has provided. And uh, if you are ready uh, to receive what the Word of God has you the, has for you this morning, say Amen. amen. All right, we're awake, which is a good sign. Take your Bibles, First Corinthians chapter fifteen. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. I seems the last two or three weeks I've been giving you a lot of material and I, I tend to be thoughtful in that so I try to scale it back just a little bit this morning uh, so uh, the flows may be a bit better as well and a little less to chew on once we leave so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 look at verse 12 together we're going to read down through about verse 20 or so we'll be looking at a few other verses here in this chapter a bit later on but we'll start here first First Corinthians 15 verse 12 Paul writing to this church says now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead but if there be no resurrection of the dead then is Christ not risen and if Christ be not risen then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, he that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perish. And in this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. I read an article the other day. Uh, it was, the title of it was this. Uh, 2023, worst year on record for billion dollar disasters. 2023 worst year on record for billion dollar disasters. Now, this is what really the, the context of the article was about. It said the U.S. experienced 23 separate billion dollar disasters in the first eight months of 2023. The largest number since records began. So that gives you a scope of really how uh, dramatic last year this year was is already it says with four months left in the year now three uh, 2023 has already surpassed the previous record of 22 events seen in all of the 2020s so 2020 2021 2022 uh, you combine all of those disasters and we have already surpassed them just in this uh, eight months or so already uh, it goes on to say this this list included 18 severe weather events that's all over our country, two flooding events, one hurricane, uh, that was Idalia, uh, one wildfire, they're saying that was the one there in Hawaii, and one winter storm. These events caused 253 direct and indirect deaths, and in doing so, $57.6 billion in damages. And consider that just for a minute this morning. You know, we've heard about a lot of these things. You know, they're, they're looking at these as a bit of, a, from an environmental standpoint is what's going on. But yet 57, $58 billion, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of destruction. That's a lot of rebuilding that needs to take place. And when we look at all these reports and maybe we scratch our head and wonder a bit and we then add to all of that, you know, it just seems to pile on the division uh, that's going on in our society, uh, that's going on in our country. We, we see all the crime that we talk about often. We see all the unrest. We could even look around the world and uh, now see these wars, the war in Ukraine, now this war in, in Israel and all that's going on. And have you ever just thought this, what is the world coming to? Ever considered that? I mean, it's a simple phrase. I'm sure we've all heard it, right? What's the world coming to? We have conversations about it. We see all this, and we ask that question. 
And often when we use that statement, you know, we're usually not in a positive way about us. You know, it's not like, hey, what's this world coming to? You know, it's, it's more of a, a bit of grief. It's more of a bit of uh, just disappointment. And I would say this morning, in the midst of all these trials we face, in the midst of all this turmoil we see going on around us, in the midst of all these things, how can you and I as believers, all right, hear this this morning, how can you and I as believers not despair? Right? Well, what is it where we can look at these things and not be discouraged, not despair? And I believe the answer is simple. It's already on the screen. We need to remember that Christ is alive. Amen. Our Savior is risen. And Paul is going to speak to this this morning. Listen, the resurrection of Christ, this is an important truth The resurrection of Christ is the one thing that keeps us from despair when the trials and testings of life come. When we look out and see the shape of the world around us, when we see these disasters, when we see the cost of war and the chaos of crime and all this destruction, and when we begin to ask ourselves, what is this world coming to? For you and I that know Christ, for you and I that have a relationship with him, our first thought then needs to be, oh, but my Savior is alive. Christ is risen again. Now, mind you, we've went through the first little bit of this chapter already, and Paul already laid out and declared for us the, the really the historical reality of the resurrection of Christ. I'm not going to go through all of that again this morning. Uh, how he points out that there were, uh, Christ was seen of hundreds of eyewitnesses. He, he went through that account. He even told this church, you can read those verses again here throughout the day in chapter 15. He even told this church at Corinth and said, listen, if you're questioning this truth about the resurrection, go talk to some of these people that were still around. He said, some folks have died that were a witness of it. But he said, there's still a lot of these individuals that were still alive in this day. And he tells these people in the church to to go see it for yourself. So we we understand the, the historical accuracy of this event. However, apparently, there were some in this church at Corinth that were still refuting really the resurrection at a whole. Whether uh, there were some in this church that uh, either thought there was just no life beyond the grave. In other words, you know, we live, we die, and that's it. There may have been some in this church at Corinth that just figured, you know what, there's, there's no resurrection, period. It's just what we, what we get is what we get. Or they adopted the bit of the Greek notion in, in teaching that the soul lives on after we die, Uh, but the body will have no future physical resurrection. So you kind of have those two groups possibly swirling in the midst of this society at Corinth, and then also even maybe within the church, because Paul is addressing this within the church. All right? And this morning, we're going to look at these scriptures, and I believe really see Paul's argument uh, supporting Uh, that we will physically rise from the dead someday. All because, it's not of us, but it's all because of Jesus Christ. It's all because of what he has done. Remember in verse 12, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Right, that's the question he's asking. He's saying those groups in this church that believe there's no resurrection, those the folks in this church that believe that, you know, hey, maybe we die and the soul lives on, but there's no resurrection, he turns that around and points to Christ. And we're going to see that in just a minute. But folks, in the midst of all the despair, and it's easy to, especially you get news yesterday and today about this conflict in Israel and now war being uh, over there and all the unrest that's going on and what then our country will do in return and on top of all the other issues we're dealing with as a society, on top of maybe some things you're dealing with personally in your own life, Christ 
is alive. And there's some great truths I think that will help us, will help you today as we declare that truth this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that our Savior is alive. We thank you, Lord, that this is an historical truth. Lord, this is documented in your word. And Lord, this morning as we see Paul's teaching on the resurrection of Christ, how that then even affects our life, how we too, Lord, have eternal life because of our Savior. God, I pray as we look around our society, as we look around our world, that we as believers would be a people that would not despair. But God, we wouldn't look at the chaos and the war and the crime and division and be discouraged. But God, I pray we would look at these things and remember this biblical truth that our Savior is alive today. And Lord, because he is alive, we also have eternal life if we put our faith and trust in him. Lord, if our Savior is alive, our outlook on this life, our outlook on how we live should be different from the lost. And God, I pray this morning you would do a great work in our service, in our church, in each life that's here this morning. God, I pray that we would just be so encouraged when we leave here today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul addresses this issue, he says, listen, there's some in this church that are refuting the resurrection. He, Paul asks a hypothetical. That's number one. This is a simple outline today. We're going to move really quickly. He asks a hypothetical question, and that is, what if there is no resurrection? What if there is no resurrection? Now that Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that Christ is, or that there is no resurrection of the dead. And he approaches this issue, I believe, as he often does, with a very logical implication or a very logical application. You know, for as deep and theological Paul is, uh, he can be just as down to earth in his teaching and preaching and his writing uh, than anyone else in Scripture. And in this hypothetical, he, he asks really some rapid-fire questions to drive home this biblical truth that, no, no, Christ is alive. Okay, so... Think of this hypothetical, what if there is no resurrection? Here's the rapid fire. He says, if there is no resurrection, then is Christ not raised either? Look at verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So he just wants these people to start to think. He's saying, listen, if you're going to tell me, if you're going to tell me to my face that there's no longer a resurrection, or if you're going to teach this principle within the church that there's no, not a resurrection, he says, then listen, what, what does that do with Jesus Christ? He says, what's your theology? What's your teaching then on Jesus Christ? He's pointing out really an oxymoron here. Right? You can't have it both ways. You can't say Christ literally and physically rose from the dead and then say that there's no resurrection. It just doesn't go hand in hand. You can't claim both. It's one period. He either rose from the dead or he didn't. Now, if there were some saying Christ didn't rise from the dead, I think he'd point that out. He's really stating this across the board. So that's the first hypothetical, or the first rapid fire, if you will. If there's no resurrection, then is Christ not raised either? He puts it pretty plainly. Secondly, verse 14 through 15, he says, If there's no resurrection, then is preaching and faith vain? Look at verse 14, And if Christ be not raised, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. He says, listen, if there's no resurrection, he says, our preaching, our faith is vain. That word vain means worthless, means empty. Think about that for a minute. 
He said, listen, everything you believe, everything that you believe about the gospel, about the Bible, about Christ, he says, it's empty. It's worthless. Your faith is empty. It's worthless. However, you and I know the very gospel proclaims that Christ is risen. He is alive. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, everything else is false. Everything is worthless. Everything is vain. One commentator said the Christian life was like a house. This is the simple truth. The house may look good on top, but if the foundation is bad, the house is bad. Christianity is built on the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus. If the resurrection is not true, all of Christianity crumbles. Folks, we must be right on this truth. Christ is alive. That's what Paul's pointing out. If he's not if he's not, then we, too, will, know, will, no, will never see a resurrection. And if he's not, our faith, our preaching, too, is worthless and empty in vain. He goes on, verse 16 and 17, if there is no resurrection, then we're still in our sin. What an awful thought. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? Here it is. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Paul states the resurrection is the active ingredient in our forgiveness. It's a necessity. It shows Christ was the acceptable sacrifice for our sin. Christ was not just a man dying for a good cause. He is the Savior dying to give us new life and forgiveness through his blood. We're going to come around this table in a little bit. We're going to remember this very thing. We're going to remember how he gave his body. We're going to remember how he shed his blood in a bit, the deacons will serve you, and you're going to get two cups. One of those cups is going to have a little piece of bread in it. It's going to be a symbol of that body of our Savior. Nothing mystical is going to happen when we come to this table. These elements don't turn into the literal flesh and blood of our Savior. They are symbols. We're going to come to this table and remember that body. We're going to remember how it was beaten and bruised, what it went through for you and I, how he willingly gave his life, how he willingly laid down his body on that cross for you and me. We're then going to take that little cup with that juice in it and the, as that is a symbol of the blood of our Savior. Boy, and there is power in that blood, has the power to forgive sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And that's what Christ did on the cross. He shed his blood for you and I. His blood poured out for you and I today. So that's what this table is all about. But oh, my friend, we don't just stop there as we come to this table. As we remember that body of our Savior, as we remember the blood of our Savior, we then would be amiss if we don't even take time to consider that he rose from the grave. He's alive. That's why it's so important. That's why it's important for you and I and us. He died to give us new life died so we could be forgiven. That's what Paul is pointing out. If there is no resurrection, if Jesus Christ is still in the tomb, that means he is dead. And if he is still in the tomb, then listen, our sins are not forgiven. But oh, the gospel is true, isn't it? We know the truth. We understand the truth. Many of you believed it. You received him. Paul goes on in verse 18, says, If there is no resurrection, then those that we love and have already died, he said, Oh boy, they're gone forever. Verse 18, Then they which also which are fallen asleep, and those that have died in Christ are perished. Oh, how sad that would be. How sad that would be to go to all of these funerals that maybe we've been part of and have no hope. Stand there over your loved one and have no assurance that they're with 
your Savior, this, their Savior in heaven. Again, these just down-to-earth questions, these hypotheticals, Paul is driving home to drive that point home. Verse 19, if there is no resurrection, then we should be pitied above all men. If, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's what that word miserable means. It means to be pitied. Why should we be pitied? I believe because it's stating we'd have a false hope. Right? We're believing in something that just even didn't, didn't, isn't true. Everything we are doing for the Lord is useless and senseless if Christ isn't risen from the dead. He goes on later in verse 30 through 32. Look at those verses. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Why is Paul doing that? Why is he desiring to die daily? Why is he in jeopardy every hour for his faith? Verse 32, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus... What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? He says, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. See, what Paul is stating here is he's pointing to everything we do for the Lord. You and I that are, that are here this morning, we spend time in the word of God. We, we try to. We try to carve out time to, to be in prayer and to have that quiet time with our Lord. We, we serve in church where we can. We, we strive to live holy. We, we strive to be pleasing to God. Right? We come and we dedicate our Sunday mornings and our Sunday nights and our Wednesday nights to the church and to gather together and to worship and, and to serve. We, we come and give and we give of our resources. We, we give of what the Lord has given us. We, we give to missions. We give of our time. Hopefully we go out and we tell others of Christ and we have opportunity where we share the gospel, the, the good news with others. Paul is stating here, if there is no resurrection, then all of this, folks, all of this is a waste of time. Why are we here if Christ isn't alive? Well, my friend, he is alive today. He is alive. Paul gives us one more example. This is a bit of an odd one. Look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? That makes sense to you? What is Paul teaching here? What is Paul talking about? It's pretty simple. But he says, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? What's, what's going on here? What's this scripture here all about? This is really why I enjoy expository and really textual study and preaching. It... it forces us to look at the entire word of God. It forces us to examine all of these things. And this verse is, I will be frank, this verse is where the Mormons, where other non-Christian religions use to defend being baptized for the dead. Uh, those that practice this thing, this is the verse they'll go to. They'll say, see here, look, Paul says we should do this. We should baptize for dead people. So what is Paul saying? Why is this here? What, what is the purpose? Well, there's two possibilities. I believe well, the latter one is true. I'll give you both of them. One possibility is that baptism uh, may have been a way to uh, publicly declare that uh, the salvation of someone who had died uh, before they were baptized. In other words, you received Christ and died and didn't get a chance to be baptized. So someone would go and essentially be baptized on your behalf, just stating that you were a believer. In such a case, there was no thought, this was true, there was still no thought that there was baptism was actually gaining any salvation. 
It was really just a declaration of, of what had already been done or what was true. However, a little bit skeptical of this. Some will say that this is what was being practiced here at Corinth. I don't believe that. Uh, I, we, see, we see this nowhere practiced or taught in Scripture. All right? So it is a possibility. The second possibility is this. The other possibility is that people were getting baptized with the idea that they would obtain salvation for those who had died. Right? Now, if that's true, this idea would then be, or this practice then would be, a pagan practice. It's something the pagans would do. This would mean they were uh, saved by baptism other than what Jesus Christ had done for them. Now, we would know Paul uh, totally rejected anything that added uh, to salvation. So, boy, if someone added works to salvation, you had to do A, B, and C to be saved, we know Paul would refute that. This would be no different. They'd be adding baptism for salvation. So in no way this morning that I believe Paul was uh, prescribing a Christian practice. It's not at all what he was doing. I believe he is commenting on a pagan practice, right, which is... Even supported, some would say, by how he wrote this verse or how the Spirit inspired him. He says, else what shall they do? He uses that word they. They do which are baptized for the dead. If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? I Many say he's using that word on purpose. He's not including the church. He's not including this group he's talking to. He's, he's addressing a, another people group outside of this church. So with that in mind, we must remember the context. What's the whole purpose of what we're going over this morning? What is Paul trying to convey to this church? Paul is defending the resurrection, right? That's the purpose of the scripture. He's not starting to, or he's not beginning to have a conversation about baptism. He is defending the resurrection of Christ, and I believe this is really just another instance where Paul is just right down to earth. Paul is saying simply this. The very fact that the pagans, right, these unbelievers are baptizing people for the dead is an evidence that even they believe there's life after death. There's a resurrection. Paul says, listen, the pagans believe there's a resurrection. Now, mind you, this isn't unordinary from Paul. He speaks this way all the time. Remember back in uh, chapter 5. We won't go there this morning. We went through this verses before. Chapter 5, he just spoke in a different light. Remember the man that was having an affair with his father's wife, right? He was having fornication with his father's wife. And Paul... To that argument says, listen, the pagans, the pagans don't even practice this. And yet you allow this man in your church to continue having this relationship with his father's wife. I think this is the very same thing he's doing here, just with the resurrection. He's saying, listen, believers, you're part of this church. He says, look at, the, look at these pagans. Look at these unbelievers. They believe there's a, there's a resurrection. He's just trying to drive home his point. To create a theology of baptizing the dead from this passage, I believe would be a serious mistake. And that's what's happened, right? We see other uh, denominations doing this very thing. All of these arguments show that the physical, actual resurrection of Christ, what are we driving at? This is a major issue. This is a major issue for the church. This is a major issue for society. This is a major issue of our faith. It is not only the cornerstone of our faith. It is the foundation upon which we build our lives in the present. We must take the resurrection seriously. I said when I started, I've been looking at all the content I've been giving you. So I scaled it back a bit for today. So now we're going to look at these verses. We've, we've examined them. Paul then declares just flat out in verse 20, 
But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that have slept. He gives those hypotheticals. He has that rapid fire about the resurrection. We listed those four or five things this morning, and then he just definitively declares, doesn't matter, Christ is alive. Period. That's what he's explaining here. That's what he's describing. And we're going to see next week, we're actually going to pick up there. We're going to see some pictures he uses and then really see some more thoughts throughout the end of this uh, chapter about the resurrection. But for application today, what's this have to do with us? What are we going to learn from this this morning? I believe just three quick things. The resurrection, as I stated a minute ago, is the cornerstone of our faith. It's the cornerstone of our faith. Through it, through the resurrection of Christ, we have hope of eternal life. Listen, when he rose again, he has victory over death in the grave. And the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you are given that victory as well. We have a hope that our loved ones that have received Christ are with the Lord all because of the resurrection. All because Christ is alive. Secondly, the resurrection gives us assurance that we're forgiven. That we're forgiven. We're going to come to this table, thank the Lord for that body of Christ, that blood of Christ that was sacrificed for us. We're going to thank him how our sins have been washed away, how we have been cleansed, how we're declared righteous, how we can go before the Father's throne. The resurrection, what it is declaring is that the payment for sin on the cross was sufficient. And folks, you can be forgiven. If you've never received him today, he wants to save you today. He wants a right relationship with you. He wants your sins forgiven. He loves you so much. He died for you. So that could take place in your life. You and I must simply put our faith and trust in him. Remember a moment ago how Paul would refuse anything added to that? Well, we refuse it as well. You don't add to the gospel It's not about how good you are or certain things you can do. It's not about being baptized. It's not about doing anything. It's about putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Have you done that today? And the third application is this. The resurrection provides us with a reason to live an obedient life. Boy, when we consider that our Savior is alive, what he's done for us today, it's not just something, we it's not just an event that we just kind of come together to celebrate once a year or remember maybe once a month around this table. It's an event that when we properly understand it, it should change the way we think and it really should change the way we live. We should be so encouraged. We should be so overcome that our Savior is alive, that we live like it, that we act like it. So the question is this, do you believe Jesus really rose from the dead or not? That's sort of a hypothetical or or just one of those rapid fire questions Paul would, would lay out. You could see him saying that. So, church at Corinth, the question is, do you really believe he rose again or don't you? Right? Community Baptist Church, do you really believe he rose again or don't you? Christian, do you really believe he rose again or don't you? Those haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, do you really believe he rose again or don't you? If you're not sure, boy, examine the evidence today. This is the word of God. This is God's word. He's provided salvation for you. We want to encourage you to settle this issue in your heart today. Heed Paul's words. Heed what he's telling you and I. If the the resurrection is not true, 
Folks, you and I are wasting our time here today. Really, we're just taking up space. We're not worshiping anything. We're just gathering together to fellowship. However, however, we know the truth. We know it is true. We know it's worth embracing that and following and with every ounce of our being what God requires of us. But so often we don't think that way. So often we get so busy with what we want to do and what we, how we want to spend our life and what we want to be doing with our time and our resources. If Christ has risen from the dead and you're one of those in this room that would say, Pastor Fisher, I unequivocally believe that Jesus Christ is alive today. I, I absolutely believe that he is alive. If that is true, if you believe that, then we should pay attention to what he says. And we should be the people that are the first ones to do exactly as he directs and exactly as he commands. You see, it ought to mean something to you. So much so that we live it every day of our life. We should do what he commands to do because Christ is alive. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Again, Lord, we thank you for this time we can come together. We can gather around your word. We can praise you, your son, for what you've done for us. Lord, today as Paul is addressing this issue at the church of Corinth, some refuting the resurrection, God, I, I pray that this morning, Lord, we would look to this evidence, we would look to the word of God, and Lord, with every ounce of our being, we would fully believe that Christ is alive. And when how this truth has changed our life forever when we put our faith and trust in him, God, we thank you for your son, for his willingness to give his body and shed his blood. But, oh God, we are so thankful that three days later, you rose him from the grave. What a declaration of victory over death, over sin. Lord, that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. Lord, his blood can cover my sin, can cover the sin of the world. Yet all I must need to do is put my faith and trust in him as my Lord and Savior. God, today, if there is one here that has never received Christ as their Savior, they're relying on something else to get them to heaven. They've been taught they need to be good or do certain things or pray certain prayers. God, I pray that they would see the truth this morning. That salvation is only through what Christ has done for us. It's through his shed blood. It's through his death. It's through his resurrection alone. And all we then must do is put our faith and trust in him. God, there may be one today that's never asked forgiveness of their sin. There may be one today that's never called upon your son to be their Lord and Savior. And God, I pray that they would settle that today. I pray, Lord, they would believe the word of God is true and receive it. I pray you'd speak to their heart. And then, God, for those of us that know this truth, we know we're born again, we, we believe Christ is alive, then, God, I pray it would just so compel us to obey, to live for you, to tell others this greatest news that we have. Lord, that we wouldn't live for ourselves. We wouldn't live just for today. But God, we would live looking forward to an eternity, desiring to bring you honor and glory, desiring to live holy before you. God, I pray I'm sure all of our hearts and believers this morning are being convicted about that very thing right now. Lord, truly not just letting the resurrection roll off our shoulders today, but Lord, truly considering how it should impact, 
how we live because it was a great cost that was paid. Lord, do a work in this invitation this morning. Speak to hearts, speak to minds, and then God also, as we come around this table in a moment, help it to be just a beautiful time as we remember our Savior today. Father, bless this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment. Listen, this morning, do you know you're born again? Do you know you're saved? We'll say it that way. Do you know you receive Christ as your Savior? Has there been a time in your life where you've asked God to forgive you of your sin, as I mentioned? Has there been a time in your life where you called upon the Lord to be your Savior? Has there been a time in your life where you believe this gospel? You believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to the, for the only way of salvation? Maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know, Pastor Fisher, I, I just want to be honest. I've never put my faith and trust in Christ, but I'd like to today. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know, I don't, I don't know what my eternity holds. I don't know what's going to happen to me after I die, but I'd like to know today. Listen, we'd like to help you. I'd like to help you. I'd like to pray for you. If that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up nice and high and say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I'm not sure, but I'd sure like your prayer this morning. I'd like to pray for you in a minute. Anyone like that at all as I look around? Pray for me. I'm just not sure. I right, think, Christian, this next thought is for us, and it should challenge us. If you believe Christ is alive today, are we living like it? Are we telling others? Are we desiring to be holy? Are we desiring to obey? Boy, look at the cost. Look what he's done for you and I. The least we could do is desire to live a holy life before him. Maybe you're here this morning. This is between you and the Lord. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But in your heart right now, you're saying, Lord, help me live for you. Lord, help me remember the resurrection, God, each and every day. Help it to spur me on in how I live. Help me, Lord, to be more obedient. Help me, Lord, to tell others. If that's you today. Spend time with the Lord right now. Father, be in this place. Work in this invitation. Work in our hearts and our lives. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for Christ. We thank you he's alive. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jeff, would you come?